look back in hindsight Everything is 2020 In hindsight We make mistakes, we're learning from this In hindsight be your today and your tomorrow In hindsight It's so much clearer now so are you curious about how blockchain technology is transforming our world and what the future holds for decentralized systems? Today, we're diving into this fascinating subject with none other than Roberto. You know what? That's what I need to get. <laughs> <laughs> Capo de H. Say it again. <laughs> Capo de H. It's, it's, it's okay. Capo cap de H. Capo de H. Capo de H. Wow, Capo. fantastic. Capo de H. All right. Capo. Capo, capo All right. Are you curious about how blockchain technology is transforming our world and what the future holds for decentralized systems? Today, I'm diving into this fascinating subject with none other than Roberto Capodice, All with right. over <laughs> close enough <laughs> with over three decades of experience in emerging technologies. Roberto has been at the forefront of blockchain innovation since 2010. From his early days in Italy to his current ventures in Singapore and Bali, his journey is a testament to the power of the digital innovation. So join us as we explore Roberto's career, insights, and major decisions that have shaped his path. Good evening, uh, Roberto. It's good morning for me, but good evening. How are you doing good. today, sir? Good morning to you. <clears throat> doing fantastic. <laughs> So thank you for having me in your show. Yeah, thanks for coming on. What where are you calling in from today? I am in Bali, Indonesia. Yes. You're in Bali. Okay, okay. I have never been to Bali. Um it looks like an amazing place to be. Uh so I I will rely on you to tell me if that's factual or not. How long have you been in Bali? 20 years only, so. 20. Okay, it has to be amazing then. <laughs> <laughs> So t tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, what, what led you to Bali for 20 years? And, um, you know, just lead in just a little bit about what led you to blockchain as well, technology. Sure. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, it's all left to the stars, to the destiny, how things happen very randomly. Yeah. I guess the first time I, I came to Asia was when I was 10 years old. Together with uh, my father, we did the travel to Bangkok, uh, Bali, and Hong Kong. Wow. So I I left a little bit of uh, DNA in the area, like in terms of uh, uh, le left a little bit uh, an imprint. But uh, mm. very much randomly, yeah, I was in Florida. Um, many years, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, chatting with somebody from Detroit. Okay. And at the time, uh, chat, uh, you don't save your username. You need to save it every time, remember people, other people's username. So somehow my computer got stolen, mm. and uh, I got a new one, and I forgot the name of this person I used to chat with. So I tried to guess it, and I got somebody that was here in Bali. So we became friends. Uh, sure enough, like uh, several years later, I wanted to take a holiday and this person popped up in the, at this time it was already Microsoft Messenger. So it was already with the saved username. Yeah. And I say, well, if I come to Bali, you help me out. And uh, sure enough, I took a flight and I arrived here. I fall in love with the place. I came back for another holiday and then uh, I decided to move uh, into this side of the planet. <laughs> wow. So you found the wrong person who ended up being the right person, and that led you to, <laughs> to Bali. Yeah, somebody become, you know, my my hook, my my hook to to arrive over here. It was just a friend, but uh, yeah, uh, it's been for sure. Uh, uh, you know, like the encouragement is nowadays I can travel to a totally unknown place. I took. Uh, Flew to Japan, rented a car with the GPS in Japanese, uh, all the sign on the road in Japanese. I didn't understand one word, but I oriented myself with the sun setting a direction or another. I went around. <laughs> no fear. At the time, taking this, uh, you know, like the courage to fly to a completely different place was something else. It must have been magnificently surprising. I loved it. Yeah. Awesome. So how did you first become interested in blockchain technology and, and what was the aha moment that made you pursue it? Right. It's been also that one, a strange coincidence. So I'm in mm -hmm. love with the telecommunications since I was a little kid, even communication. So when I was a kid, I used to go around 
Uh, if there was a phone booth, they would put a coin inside, call somebody again, actually in Japan. And, uh, you know, the idea that uh, in Italy, little kid, that somebody in Japan to wake up from their bed and go to answer this phone, you know, yeah. the power to move somebody on the other side of the planet was quite powerful. And, you know, this is something that only fascinated. I had uh, the CB, the, you know, like uh, to mm -hmm. call uh, uh, via radio and, um, you know, when, when modem came out, uh, so you can connect with the computer. Yeah. And that's just been an evolution. And uh, after the internet was already uh, consolidated things, uh, um, the idea of a peer-to-peer -peer network was what fascinated me. At the time, people downloaded the music and movie from a service like Kaza or, uh, you know, they were centralized, meaning that uh, there was a server that managed the whole network. So law enforcement can go and shut down these places because they were shutting down the server. When uh, uh, BitTorrent, uh, which was a protocol that was fully peer-to-peer, -peer, came out, <laughs> then uh, they had to change the rule. The regulator had to change the law because uh, you cannot stop something that is uh, distributed, the peer-to-peer -peer network, where there is no one server that is more important or is a central point of failure. Mm -hmm. And this was very fascinating. So I started working on this technology, and that was many years before blockchain even came out. And But I was already there in the right place, uh, and uh, so I got involved from uh, the early, early, early day. Wow. Uh, let's say day minus one, or even day zero. And uh, and here I am now. <laughs> <laughs> so where where are you now? So what do what do you consider? What is your title? And and what is your let's see, like, do you consider yourself a, a guru or an expert in blockchain? And what does that even mean? Right. Oh. <laughs> and to say that uh, um, when uh, the infrastructure of a solution is decentralized mm -hmm. is uh, very different from regular uh, infrastructure that there are in uh, IT solution with client server or uh, the classic uh, online uh, central servers thing. So it requires a very different uh, uh, mental approach to study an architecture of such a you know, different aspect. And mm -hmm. uh, not many people had, uh, you know, more now, but in Years ago, not many people developed the capacity to organize uh, things in such a way. Plus, culturally, yeah. there was no something like that. <clears throat> Having been in peer-to-peer -peer network from before, I already understood the logic of uh, a distributed uh, system. And uh, so it was easy for me to, to approach. They call me OG, <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, in this industry, just because I was there from the from the early days. And something interesting, a lot of people call me for consulting because uh, mm. they know that I know. So it's, uh, it's easy to, for me to, to analyze things, right? All right, so I'm going to stay on the topic of bit, bit, uh, <laughs> bit chain. I'm <laughs> blockchain. I'm thinking bit torrent and blockchain and put it together. So I'm going to stay <laughs> on blockchain just a little bit. What are... Um, some of the most significant challenges that you faced, and I know I'm, I'm branching a whole lot of years, right? But what were mm. some of the significant challenges that you faced while developing uh, blockchain technologies? And keep it simple for me, please. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I do my best. That's exactly maybe one of the challenges, right? So culturally, this is not a known thing. Mm -hmm. The basic idea that user consumer should not even be worried what there is behind that, that makes things work right right when people say something complex is rocket science uh, but with the rocket science you see the rocket taking off and going to the sky Elon Musk know very well so people can relate it to the final effort of the technology of the work but when right. you have something that is completely hidden you know like uh, people yeah. don't hardly appreciate it because unless there is a uh, an application on top of it to make you understand what it is. So, for example, all the uh, internet protocol mechanics that connect the router server in the internet, hardly people know how they work, what they are. They don't even need to worry. They turn on their computer and they surf into a website uh, and they, they're a consumer. You don't need to know the engine in order to drive the car, right? Right, right. Even though in the past, uh, to get uh, the test, uh, to get your driver license, you need to also pass some technical question now. <laughs> it's even illegal to touch the engine of your car. Right. <clears throat> so and pretty much uh, this is the challenge uh, that uh, very powerful solution uh, are hard to explain to the person that need them, actually. Yeah. Uh, because they don't understand what's the change between uh, where they are now and where they can be tomorrow. Mm. So this is one uh, one challenge. But I 
spent <laughs> is close to 15 years explaining yeah. every other day it is same exact thing. So I became good at it. In fact, if you want, I can give an explanation of the value of blockchain for everybody in two minutes without, <laughs> you know, something that can be understood easily. Yeah, please go go okay. ahead. All right. Okay. <laughs> First of all, there is the big misunderstanding that blockchain means cryptocurrencies, right? So mm -hmm. cryptocurrency is one use case the blockchain allow. Blockchain came up as a solution to create Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency. But uh, it's like to say that the wheel has been invented to have a car or a cart, if you want, but you can use it for tons of different other things that we signed mm -hmm. to be in the car. So the blockchain has a, a huge value when you think of the revolution that it brings if you think that we are in a digital world everything used to be analog you know like we had yeah. vinyl disc uh, uh, videotapes uh, music yeah. cassette and so on and so forth right and now there is everything is digital the big limitation that we had though, which was an advantage depending on the point of view is that when you make a copy and paste of something digital the copy is identical to the original by mm. bit and byte is one and zero the same one and zero you mm. don't even know which is the original anymore so mm. uh, something that uh, was amazing but also limiting in the digital world was the fact that you cannot have singularity unicity you cannot point to a file and say that's that's the one you know because you make a copy <clears throat> and the other one is identical so you don't know anymore which one was the original right okay with blockchain, if you think about it, if I give you my Bitcoin, I don't have it anymore. And this yeah. is amazing, right? <laughs> That's why it is a monkey. People start selling around for a fortune of money. Very interesting. Uh, not much for the monkey, I guess. But for the <laughs> fact that you can own a piece of something digital, can resell it, uh, can give it to your friend. And this is the one unique piece. As much as the Bitcoin is one, and once I give it to you, I don't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. And if you bring this... Uh, <clears throat> very important uh, revolution that in the digital world uh, is arrived together with blockchain and you bring it to the everyday life uh, you have a lot of advantages for example the ownership title of my car can be one digital item in a blockchain so when i sell you my car i hand it to you and if the police stops you on the road they can check in the blockchain uh, the ownership title this cannot be counterfeit is cryptographically secure is always available and uh, so this has a, a very powerful impact uh, in, uh, you know, preventing uh, corruption, crimes, uh, mm. you know, of a different sort uh, uh, when yeah. it comes to falsifying documents and things. Uh, and right. uh, <clears throat> it's always available. So you cannot say, ah, I left it home. I don't have it with me. You know, so think about the driver license. Uh, think about uh, many other things, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Empower cryptographic signature. So digital signature is not the one that you sign in the small screen at the restaurant. That's just a signature. Uh, <laughs> save the digital if you want. But here we're talking about mathematical signatures. So okay. uh, there are mathematical functions in all the world of cryptography that is applied on blockchain. They're allowed to identify in a, uni in a way that is impossible to falsify unless somebody steals your private a secret password, let's say, right. uh, somebody's signature identity. So in many things, if you think about the flow of documentation, I give mm -hmm. always the example, I need to register at the gym. The gym wants a certificate from a doctor that I'm healthy to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And the doctor needs to be registered with the government as a doctor that got his degree. So his university degree is in the blockchain. Everybody can verify is actually the doctor wow. because he's signed. So, so, so you yeah. have the guarantee of the quality of things and you have... Also, the security that if something goes to the next step is because everything complied until before. So, you know, rather than uh, you registering at the gym without a valid certificate, you know, because uh, the secretary signed off for you. And, you know, so yeah. it, it is powerful on one, on one side. It is maybe giving more. And plus, it, it removed the man in the middle. Mm -hmm, so... Mm -hmm. You, you deal directly between one party and another without having to elect a third party as a guarantor of uh, the transaction or True. whatever it is, is, which gives you more responsibility when you do something because nobody can block you or stop you say no. <laughs> 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 but uh, wow. uh, but it's more interesting, you know, it's more powerful. So you, you kind of touched and maybe I'm ignorant, right, to it. I'm looking, listening to your explanation on some, some things like that could happen and probably are ha happening already. But how do you see blockchain um, 
uh, the technology evolving in the next decade and, and what industries do you think will be most impacted? <clears throat> and we'll probably say financial, but anyway. Which no, ones? The financial <laughs> aspect, but it's interesting also the financial aspect that uh, what is called the centralized finance, DeFi. Mm -hmm. You know, people can get loans uh, giving guarantee tokens. Uh, there was somebody says, I finished paying my car. They buy mm -hmm. my loans all online, so I didn't have to sign anything, give my document to anybody. So it's really accessible by everybody. It doesn't matter if the bank likes you or not or makes money out of you. So you have this uh, full uh, uh, access that is open worldwide to anybody, which is powerful on one side. Mm -hmm. On another, I think that uh, as soon as the hype is over, that all this big hype that has been around also with cryptocurrency, people start adopting the technology for what it is, which is right. going to be something important. The most affected uh, industry are supply chain. We think mm -hmm. this is something that uh, allow people that have no common uh, legal uh, aspect uh, to work together, meaning that uh, supply chain is a good example because there is a producer of something, sell it to somebody else, it is other modified, sell it to the other mix with other things, sell it to all these people can be in different country, different legislation, different languages. Uh, so it's harder to get a rule book uh, like a law firm uh, that put all together, to sign a common contract to work together. So blockchain guarantee it's like a phone network. You can make phone calls to each other, but with some written rules that need to be respected to uh, stay in the game. So whoever gets something knows that nobody cheated. So it's, it's as it is. So this is guaranteed. Right. The truth is guaranteed. Another industry, very interestingly, is gaming. Mm, you know that yeah, uh, you yeah. in the game, you have to fight and you finally have the gold sword that, that you can do something. <laughs> this gold sword usually lives inside the game. But uh, okay. it can become a digital asset because it's unique eh? that mm -hmm. you can bring with you in another game because oh, wow. uh, it's in the blockchain. So <clears throat> already they start with the avatar. So if mm -hmm. I am blonde with a, a green jacket uh, or something like this in a game, then if my digital identity, what they call Web3 identity, is what I use to log in in the other game and they're compatible, they follow some standards, you're going to see me in the same way there. If in the previous game I lost one arm, I probably log in the next game without the arm <laughs> because, yeah. uh, you <laughs> know, my true. identity follow me. That's why it's the evolution of the web, web 2 to web 3. Web 2 is passive. So you have the network, yeah. you click somewhere. Yeah. Web 3, you have something that follow you wherever you go. So it is, it is interesting. <clears throat> All right. So let's, let's pull it back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And then sorry. For, for, for giving <laughs> me... <laughs> no, we got to do it. We got to talk about it. Like, you know, which I, I want to learn. I learned a little bit, you know, but it's so complex. So I appreciate you, you know, kind of filtering out all the, the as, techno as words. As I was saying before, the consumer doesn't need to know what they yeah, need behind. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. There was a kid that was uh, using Facebook in cell phone. So he says, Ah, oh, you have the internet. So no, I don't have internet. But you're using Facebook. Actually, it's Facebook is not internet, you know. So <laughs> he had no connect, you know, comprehension that to work, you need the connect. And this is beautiful, I think, you know, like uh, when yeah. you become so magic that you don't even need to explain it. <laughs> it is as, as it is. You know? Isn't that the truth? <laughs> so. So where were you born initially? I guess in an hospital from my mom mostly. <laughs> <laughs> what country were you born in, <laughs> Roberto? <laughs> okay, thank you for the precise question. I'm, I'm a computer programmer. So, you know. I know, I know, I know. I should know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I was born in Italy. I'm Italian because as okay. everybody's perfect. So everybody thinks I'm Italian. But uh -huh, I've been uh -huh. living, uh, I spent the first 18 years in Italy, grew up in Venice, uh, which is a city in the north with the Mm -hmm. water and canal and gondolas i don't know and uh, they imitate in las vegas there is a copy many different countries they make a copy of venice you see uh and uh then i spent uh, 12 years uh, pretty much uh, in florida between florida. florida with mm -hmm. italy and florida uh in the gulf of mexico and mm -hmm. now it's 20 years that uh, i am here i just turned 50 years old uh, a uh, week ago, about uh, happy birthday! Years ago, <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I know, I know that I look twenty-five, but you know, <laughs> it's the I white like beard it. that gives me away. But I, I shaved mine off, so <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so why you look eighteen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. so so you moved from so you were in Italy, eighteen. You moved to Florida. 
Gulf of Mexico, and then you moved to Bali, and you had significant time in each Singapore. of these locations in Singapore. So, Singapore, what, yeah, Singapore. So, what were some of the challenges, like going, just transitioning from one country to the next? Those seem like extremes. Were they extremes? And what were some of your some of your challenges? And in, and in, and I'll just keep it going. How did you overcome those challenges? Yeah, and I think that the challenge uh, is a funny word because uh, it mm-hmm. can have a negative and a positive connotation. You know, mm-hmm. people love challenges. People is, uh, damn, I, I had a challenge to overcome, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it's beautiful to see that there is so many new things. Uh, strangely, living in Venice is such a touristic place. Everybody in the world go to visit it once in a lifetime. But when you live there, yeah. you just go around without... Uh, appreciating anything so a friend sometimes told me try to go around and think you're a tourist that is for the first time seeing this yeah. place and it's amazing there are things that is so weird but you don't notice because everyday life uh, you know brings you to the and yeah. when you move to a new place uh, is uh, really the beauty of looking at everything mm. with the eye of uh, discovery you become a little kid again you know everything mm-hmm. is exciting Everything is exciting, even things that are totally not exciting for, you know, people that is there forever. Mm-hmm. Right? Just uh, silly things because we have references from movies, then we see something. Like, for example, I went crazy in New York to walk in back alleys, which <laughs> is restaurant through the trash. It's not really the very interesting place. <laughs> but because okay. they have this fascination, because they don't exist yeah. in Europe, because uh, see they're built in a different way. So uh, the smell of certain places, uh, you know... I did it since I was uh, 14, the first time I traveled alone. At the mm-hmm. time, it was possible. Now the airport stops uh, <laughs> young kid if there is no permission from the parents. Right? Mm. And, and you know, just getting lost uh, in Prague, in London, in other places. And, wow. you know, getting to know random people. Uh, it is uh, it always make you wealthier in terms of uh, knowledge, understanding, yeah. you know. And... Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much the beautiful challenge mm-hmm. that I had. Sure enough, there are a lot of uh, obstacles, if you want, okay. from uh, <clears throat> you know working, uh, discrimination uh, in many aspects, uh, which seems strange. But being Italian, uh, there are mm-hmm. parts of the world where you are like above, a part of the world where you are like below. <laughs> so they look at you <laughs> okay. in a different way. Okay. And, uh, uh, Asia for sure is an advantage place, you know, like mm. uh, strangely enough. But uh, I guess that's that's beautiful to have this, and you start to build in the confidence that you can be dropped uh, bare naked uh, in the middle of somewhere, and you can start from zero and make it uh, successfully every time. You know, I already have, uh, you know, people do their plan in case of zombie invasion. I do my plan in case <laughs> I hit the rock bottom and I know how to get up and restart everything. And it's beautiful oh, wow. to prove it to yourself. Now, yeah. there is an age for everything. So yeah. I guess, uh, you know, now is more the age to relax a little bit. But uh, until yeah. I was younger, that's a good thing to do. Right, right. Wow. So, go okay. So let's go back from, you went from Italy to, to uh, Florida. Is that? Mm-hmm. Okay. So take us back to that. Tra- so why did you go to Florida? Okay. Right. Also, that then random. And then, and then, how did you prepare to go to Florida? I did not. You so did not. You, <laughs> <go ahead. laughs> the story is quite interesting. Uh, my uncle, my brother, my father's brother, uh, uh-huh. used to call me. I, for some strange reason, he had uh, like a scholarship and he studied in Boston, and he, he remained very well impressed about the United States. And okay. he's called me Little American. But I don't know why, since I was a little kid, and this thing brainwashed me. And mm-hmm. when I turned 18, the first thing I wanted to go and see it is America, what it is about, you know, that there is. Yeah. It is a... And uh, I bought a flight to New York with nothing else but a car rental. So I arrive at La Guardia, go to the car rental. They say, you need to be 21 to rent a car. Yeah. So I'm going to call my lawyer. I'm going to sue you. So they said, sorry. <laughs> so because they asked, they were convinced to give me the car. And they asked, where do you want to go? I want to go to Canada. They said, okay, bye-bye. Right. So they Goodness say, you need, to take a, you need to take a Greyhound bus. And I had no idea of the dimension. It was already evening. So right. I arrived in the middle of the night in Jamaica, in Queens, in New York, there. Mm. And uh, with uh, this camera around my neck, a backpack on my shoulder, quickly. 
taxi and then I met somebody that was working as an illegal taxi and okay. uh, when we were he was driving me toward the ground the station to take a bus he says you know I just sold this car it was an old Chrysler of these huge cars and uh, I said oh my god and says I sold it for eight hundred dollars and to me it was shocking because in Italy eight hundred dollars would not even be enough to pay the tax to change ownership <laughs> of a car. And they're thinking wow. that uh, yeah it's actually <laughs> many things in America people complain are actually a very good advantage. And uh-huh. uh so oh, I bought this car from this guy. He says tell the other guy no I'll give back the money, I give a hundred dollar more <laughs> and I took this huge car and with this car I went to Quebec City in the north of Canada. <laughs> And then down to Key West in Florida. Then my oh, intention wow. was to go back and go to California, but the car spoke to me and says, no, I can't. I am already <laughs> old enough. <laughs> and he broke down. He broke down uh, in uh, Georgia, yeah. uh, where I met a couple uh, that were going from Florida to South Carolina for the wedding of the mother of the girl. And uh, practically their car was not fixable. Mine got fixed because, you know, all cars are <laughs> forever. Yeah, yeah. So I give them a ride. I give them a ride and they invited me to this wedding. I stay a week wow. with them. I became good friends. So then I, they were living in Florida. So I went back to visit them. And then one visit, another visit, another visit. And then I was more the time I was spending my time in Florida than in Italy because I was mm. always... Uh, the visa was automatically given by arrival and it was okay. lasting six months. So I was just arriving, staying six months. And so I was making good money with my IT computer activities since then. And uh, so I was enjoying life. <laughs> so, so you're enjoying life. Wow, that's, that's interesting. I wonder if he can still do that today. Just um, land and just start driving well, around the country. Like I guess, I guess would... you can if you got a laptop and you have a mm. skill set in technology. Go ahead. There are what they call digital nomads, uh-huh. and there digital is a nomads. very interesting nomad, very big in Bali in Indonesia. So much that many countries give special visa for uh, digital nomads. And oh, this wow. is people that uh, either stay the minimum available, like the three months classic the country give you when you arrive. You know, like. Uh, good passport uh, usually you travel to most country you can stay one month 30 days or 90 days or 60 mm-hmm. days based on the country so these people just keep moving country every 30 days which also is interesting because give them no fiscal uh location so they don't pay taxes pretty much because yeah. an american citizen has to pay taxes doesn't matter where he is in the world if you make an income the rest of the world our government are a little bit more clement so if we make money outside the, the country you need to settle your taxes whatever you are but in order to become resident pay taxes you need to spend at least six months or one year based on the country so when you keep moving every few months yeah you you, you are no no resident anywhere so you are not eligible for taxes anywhere so this is pretty wow. neat and, so, and there is a huge quantity of people that have online shops uh, they mm-hmm. do you know drop shipping they do you know content creator uh, influencer or whatever that uh, do this between thailand uh, vietnam indonesia is full of western people that just do this as a living so yes it's yeah. possible actually uh-huh. it's easier now than it was in the past because there was no cell phone there was no, <laughs> no other book, so. that's, that's true that's <laughs> the map true. was a big book that you have to have in the passenger seat to understand where you go there was no gps so yes <laughs> I always, uh, I know there's a lot of, just talking to you, there's a lot of layers of technology uh, that go along with the GPS, but whoever mm. made that damn GPS yeah. <laughs> has really given me some freedom, right, to go out and travel. So uh, definitely. Yes. And the wow. technology is very simple with the GPS, actually. It's I, I, one of I, the most basic uh, technology <laughs> in the planet, but yes. Right. So, so you didn't appreciate Italy while you were living there, like most people do um, Mm. in any place they live, because it's where they're at. Right. Mm. So you come to the United States. What was the what was what area, location, person, thing? What was the most impactful besides the family going to the wedding uh, (laughs) thing that you've seen or, or did while you were in the United States? 
Well, you know, there is a reason why you can Google Florida man and uh, a date of the year. Maybe usually people do with their own birthday, you know, Florida man, a birthday you see, which is the strange crime or the strange things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because Florida is a place that doesn't belong to the planet. In fact, the south of the United States is Georgia, <laughs> where you finish, you know, it's like, it is interesting. And uh, I was fascinated by the place and the, by the people living there, yeah. which 99% are non native, is all people that come from the north during the winter or people yeah. that just retired there. Uh, I think I saw in the time I was there three times happened uh -huh. that it was these people that must be 100 plus driving the car with the oxygen bottle on the passenger seat <laughs> passing away <laughs> while driving so dying oh, the moment Lord. that they drive and just go with the car out so th that people live the life until the last minute to you the know, last really. and, moment oh my god is a place that is a very 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 interesting and i've been spending half of the time together uh -huh. with the middle high class people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the rest of the time, I brought my early days on from Europe. I was in a motorcycle club. I was uh, with a girl. A girl was one day told me, "Oh, you have beautiful teeth." And I said, "Me beautiful teeth." And I look around. There was the only one that had teeth. Actually, so, <laughs> so it was really like this experience in the redneck to the deepest level as being beautiful yeah. people. You know what? Uh, not a good grammar in English, if you want, but uh, down to the heart, uh, I think I saw the most amazing people that uh, that i met in a long time so it's yeah. been quite an interesting experience so yeah that's, that's what nice. uh, my yes my <laughs> my life in the u.s has been a, a big lesson uh, in many aspects of life very interesting i tell you i went to italy one time and i was only there for 45 minutes so i was oh. in the, <laughs> i was in the military uh for, oh, for right. 20 years and uh, it's a it's a whole story, but in my route to get to where I was supposed to be, um, I had to uh, land in in Italy, and I wanted to be there for a while. I was only there forty five minutes. It really irritated me, so I didn't get to appreciate Italy either. So. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> yeah, there was this big debate: Can I claim to have been in a country if I only, you know, ship yeah. flights in the airport or not? <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so I was I was I landed on a base because I had to fly, and, I, and I'll give you the quick thing. Nine eleven happened. We had to go to Bosnia for peacekeeping. My unit was in the air during nine eleven when that was all going on, and oh, I was boy. behind them. So I went a few weeks later and ended up in uh, Skopje, Macedonia. I say Skopje, but you know, in Macedonia, they had to take us to Kosovo. They had to take us to Italy and then Germany. I stayed in Germany for two days before we ended up in Bosnia. So oh. um, so that's why I was in Italy for 45 days, which does not count as an official days trip. Or minutes, sorry, I mean, because... 45 minutes, 45 minutes. Oh, okay. Because... <laughs> which does <laughs> not count <laughs> yeah, as an official uh, visit to the country. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but, but can you share a significant choice that you were forced to make in your career or your personal life? Yes. Um, interestingly enough, I have, I'm a father of four. Okay. I'm a father of four, and uh, the oldest one is uh, 32 years old, and mm -hmm. the little one uh, is three years old. So I have a 29 year span between the first and the last uh, at the moment until more come. And um, <laughs> the number two and number three, the mother, when they said i'm fed up about you the kids and left and she left mm. me alone with the kids mm -hmm. and uh, i had to make an important set of choices because i used to go to conferences to speak at conferences and they wouldn't let me in with the kids mm. and i said look somebody has to check the kids when i speak you know like or i can right. enter you know i just do a no show for this people know so life has taken particular uh, different direction but from uh, uh, telling the good night story to the kids uh, from morning, preparing them for school, whatever, you know, has been, uh, uh, and I had to change a lot how I was living my life because yeah. I couldn't travel anymore. Sometime at meeting, I would leave at four in the morning and come back 11 in the night after flying in another country and coming back the same day because I don't want to leave the kids by themselves. At the same time, I didn't want to find a replacement for the mother so i didn't want the girlfriend to be like uh, so it's yeah. been no easy also there to find the right people at the same time i was approaching 
my middle age crisis. Uh, so I wanted to have a very beautiful crisis. So I bought an Harley Davidson. I bought a Rolex. <laughs> you know, like the things that you do when you need to have a middle age crisis. But with two little kids, so it wasn't easy also there to 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 manage and handle situation. So yeah. now they are uh, sixteen and fourteen. And now I'm married with a fantastic woman. I think the best person I ever met in my life. Beautiful. And uh, so <clears throat> I'm very, I'm very good off. But I, I spent a few years that uh, really made me, force me to change uh, how I was living my life. You know, I, I don't regret. I did it uh, happily because you know mm -hmm. kids are the the reason of your life. When you have kids, uh, there's no other reason to wake up in the morning that for them. <clears throat> but. Uh, you know, as being no easy I had to sacrifice a lot of uh, important moment for my career that would have been much better, much bigger, you know, not yeah. that I'm doing bad, you know, but it would have been even better possibly, you know? Yeah. Yes. You answered all the damn questions. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, how did this choice like affect your life's trajectory? So it gave you more time with your kids, um, but it kind of made you take a, a little bit, you know, cause you're still doing great. Uh, take a little bit of a back seat to the trajectory that your career was taking you. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and, uh, I missed a few trains, I would say, because of this thing, but yeah, happily now. I'm gonna well, now I send them to child labor. You know, there is Nike factories here. <laughs> so uh, they get my back. They're due with me. So we are even now. <laughs> oh my send goodness. Them to China for a few, for a few years. <laughs> do they do they do a lot of traveling? I uh, have been traveling with me everywhere. I mean, like, uh, I think that kids uh, that be traveling more than them are not frequent. It's even actually interesting to live in a place, to live in touristic destination. Bali in Indonesia is very big touristic destination. Yeah. You know, Venice in Italy, Florida in the United States as well. You know, it's like strange. Yeah. Uh, you see a lot of people that come and go. Compared yeah. if you live in the small village in the middle of somewhere, there is always the same people. And sometimes there is the foreigner that go by. In this place is opposite. The people that stay long time are very few, mm -hmm, and the rest mm -hmm. of the people come and go. Some just for a short time, some for a few years, but uh, hardly people stay. Yeah, and uh, and then it shapes uh, differently how you grow up because when you are in a place, you have you're always your friend uh, from kindergarten to you know sometimes even university. Right. Well, here and thank God that we live in an online world because now my kids, uh, the different friends that they had, just the friend that came by and left, yeah. they are uh, online <laughs> friends. So they okay. are connected with people everywhere in the planet. And this brought us, we had a, a holiday in Estonia because two friends were living there. Then uh, we met people somewhere Estonia. else. So uh, yeah. they, they have a more network of international network than myself. And then they are still teenagers. So that's pretty powerful. That is really, that is really amazing. So so just hearing their perspective from you, from you, do you think it's more beneficial to, to, to live in a small town that's out? I don't know how you described it or to live in a tourist trap, a tourist trap, to live in a tourist, envi <laughs> a tourist environment, <laughs> right? It's a good sleep. It's funny. It's funny because uh, spending a lot of time in the United States, I took like the shape of the average American, which is uh, yeah. a little bit of kilos more or actually pounds more to the American. And when I walk around in Venice, uh, they think I'm American. Mm. I can speak a local dialect. So even yeah. even uh, somebody from another part of Italy would not understand them, but they can understand them deeply. And I hear the comments so I near, you know, like uh, how they think when there is a foreigner, they think they're protected by the language barrier, but they are not, you know. So living in a place that is international compared mm -hmm. to living in a small place has a completely different effect on people's lives. Right. Uh, one usually envy the other. There is no best solution. Like, you know, somebody no. that grew up in the ranch with their own cows, with other friends working the soil like this, an amazing life. Mm -hmm. But ask them, they think they want to go for an office job. People living in the office in the cubicle hate it uh, and they want uh, the freedom. So there is, uh, I think, the plus and the minus uh, everywhere. Um I like the idea to be exposed to the biggest quantity of culture, ideas, uh, and opinion, but at the same time, make it harder to form your own uh, because yeah. uh, you don't have uh, 
but you're more free to choose because uh, judgment is different. You go in the small village, uh, you're an artist, you go to mass anyway because as everybody points a finger toward you, for example. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. like you, you are in a place where everybody changes, you find the person agree with you or disagree, who cares tomorrow there is somebody else, right? So, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I think about it. Sometimes I envy, you know, when you have individuals who have a friend, especially at my age, right? So I'm in the 50 club too, you know, who have friends from when they were children, uh-huh. right? Yeah. And, you know, I lived in Maryland. So I grew I was born in Maryland and I grew up there and, and left once I joined the military. And we moved a lot, but I really didn't. I was born in Baltimore. Are you familiar with Baltimore City? I've never been, but I know the Baltimore City. You is. probably you probably drove through it on your way from oh, yes, for Canada sure. down right. to Florida, right? <laughs> this is your forty-five minutes in Italy. Yes. <laughs> my, my two hours in the <laughs> just driving through in the yeah. highway. Yes. Yeah. So so, but I never really had. Uh, I had friends, but I never really stayed connected. And I uh. think so. I envy some of those who still are connected with their childhood friends, right? I have friends from the military, or I have friends from the industries that I'm in, right? But, you know, childhood friend, I kind of am envious yeah. of that. Go ahead. This is a something. blessing. I think it's not related to where you grow up. It's related to how you click with somebody. Yeah, I have yeah. two friends that are, uh, I'm thinking, I'm 50. They're going to be 50 in a couple of months. Yeah. And uh, one of them I know since I'm three years old. So it's 47 years old. We know each oh, other. Wow. The other I was six because I met in elementary school, which ended up to be my best friend uh, for many. For, yeah, we'll call it best friend now. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, the, the the connection that creates uh, is almost uh, to the borderline of telepathy. You know, if I fall sick, yeah. he's gonna call me because he feels it. Uh, and uh, if he disappears for months, we still know that he's okay. He's a friend. You know, like it's it's, it's, it's something we know each other deeply. We have our right. Own. Uh, it is it is nice but then it happened that i meet somebody you know for the first time two months ago and we become best buddies in a second uh, and we can understand each other very well you know there is people that you click with a lot so it, it is oh, yeah. a strange thing having somebody long that since long time is a little bit of a legacy in terms that uh, you have the op- option to say many things happen among uh, you know our lives uh, but we hang out with different group of friends. Uh, we've been to different schools after elementary school, you know, like, but still we remain connected uh, somehow mm-hmm. because uh, I, I don't know, it, it works. But yeah. yeah, I think it is in, it is an interesting thing, but uh, you, you, may meet, you may meet somebody one day and be automatically, the, depends how you feel, uh, you know, and how yeah. the other person feels. This is similar to being in a city. I uh-huh. feel that was so fun in a bad city. Oh, a big memory, a fantastic <laughs> memory. Somebody has got there and uh, get robbed. There's a bad experience. It's the worst city uh, on the planet, you know. Yeah, yeah. And this is with other people. You know? I think it's the same. Wow. What's the worst experience that you had in the States? <laughs> I know you've been all over the place, but I'm focusing on the States because that's where I'm at. So I just want to know. <laughs> I had a, a, a scary, but the thing that wasn't worse, uh, Meaning that nothing bad happened at the end of the day. So I, okay. I, I, I was in New York. I was curious about his uh, the the city that never sleeps, right? So it's yeah. famous for this thing. So I go in the village in the Green Village, and I go in a club that we're playing jazz. Uh, I stay there mm-hmm. at two or three in the morning. I say, sorry, we're closing down. I was the only person, so they kicked me out. And this was, you know, those uh, you go down the stairs on the side of the road. Uh, right. I climb up and. The place was completely desert, and there were people burning a fire in a corner. And uh, wow. they see me, and two start walking fast over me. They didn't seem, you know, friendly. Right, so I turned right. on the other side, and there were two other people coming toward me from the other junction. And I looked back, and the door was locked behind me from this club. I had nowhere to go. And a taxi driver goes by, see me. I promise, like a scene of the movie, make it hit the brakes so the car goes like all bleak, or opens the door. For you crazy, come in, come in. So I don't get in. Taxi, but, but, <laughs> quite, 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 uh, quite an experience. I had to, they stole my car. I, uh, I grabbed the door. I, the guy dragged me. This is another thing in Washington. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, 
And then somehow many people called the police. There were like 20 police cars in this junction. They started looking around. And uh, at the end, we found the car. And the guy stole only my camera. So there were like a few thousand dollars inside the book. And he left the book there. Oh, good. So, like, experience that always... You can see the positive side at the end, you know, like yeah. even if they oh, were yeah. a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but experience nonetheless, you know, like yeah. people have been nice with me uh, most of the time. Even people that usually is not nice with other people, right? They've been nice with me, you know. Probably they see me like one of them. I don't know, you know, like uh, I was traveling really like close to a homeless kind of, uh, you know, no my showers, uh, dirty clothes, uh, yeah. Because I thought that was the best way, you know, to get into. Because if somebody stopped me, police officer stopped me, I can speak properly. I can yeah. show that, you know. But if right. the other people, I mean, more I'm closer to them, <laughs> so I can become friends with everybody. <laughs> and so the gold Good. Rolex is the one of the Middle East crises I put it away when it comes to travel. <laughs> this is so I, don't, I don't get into bad, <laughs> bad situation. I tell you what, I really love your spirit and I love your adventurous spirit as well. And it seems kind of funny right when you look at you know your your area of expertise which is blockchain and, and for it. me i would assume that someone who's locked in you know in your laboratory right and and kind of maybe an introvert in a sense but you seem very outwardly but that's what made me more successful in this career because you are right yeah most of the people in this uh, field are socially awkward if yeah. you want to say they have no my social skills so being blessed with that and the mm. brain for being a geek, if you want, and it's what made me sell well since I was uh, young. So, you know, I opened Beautiful. my first company with the authorization of the court when I was 14. I was uh -huh. underage and I was already having important client, important project. So oh. it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. I like it. Hey, so where, where can we? the listeners myself find out on well, Ari no because Ari looked you up but find out a little bit <laughs> uh, more about you Roberto well in LinkedIn if it's for business my handle yeah, is very business. simple is RC10 uh -huh. and I can explain you why because uh, my family name Capo Dieci, the one that you butchered a little bit <laughs> <of the> <laughs> I'm not going to try to do it again either <laughs> means in Italian Capo is the boss you okay. know, capo, okay. Dieci is number 10. Dieci. So, dieci. So, uno, capo due, tre, quattro. Dieci. Capo Dieci, okay. boss of 10, probably was a, a title in the army, like uh, the chief of the small squad of 10 people or something like this in the past. No idea. And uh, so, RC, Roberto Capo, 1, 0, 10, dieci. So, Roberto Capo Dieci. So, RC, 1, 0. That's my handle in uh, LinkedIn. So, linkedin.com slash IN slash RC, 1, 0. Easy okay. to find me there. So, there you go. Okay. <laughs> and, and and I guess since you're working behind the the curtain, sort of like the Wizard and the Wizard of Oz, there's no need to ask you what you're working <laughs> on. <laughs> right? Wait, I want to understand it anyway. But what if it was someone who was in 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 blockchain who was interested in maybe uh, picking your brain about some things mm -hmm. or just in technology? Is there a way? Is, is it only LinkedIn or is there a website or something like that yeah, for a business have, that I, you're I, working I, on? My website, uh, I'm making a new one soon, but the old one is still there. It's a little bit, uh, you know, with the uh, spider webs around. But uh, <laughs> it, there is a very simple shortcut to get there, which is rcx.it. R, again, Roberto, C, Capo. Hmm. X is the numeral 10 for Roman numbers. So rcx.it. Uh -huh. IT, like Italy, because I'm Italian, or like information technology, which is my job. So rcx.it. <laughs> And there you go. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was. If you want, if you want any easier one, my phone number <laughs> oh, no. is. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But see, is is uh, something I learned in the United States that I never see anywhere else in the world. When the phone number spell words because you have the letter on the phone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. my phone number is plus three nine for Italy, three nine for Italy, which is X three nine. Uh -huh. And then the phone number is X computer. So EX computer. So is uh, XX computer plus uh, or zero zero wow. XX computer. <laughs> there you go. So that's uh, in WhatsApp. People can send me a message in uh, plus uh, XX computer. There you go. All right. I'm so putting all, we, we, all of this is going out. So <laughs> there you, you go. Might see an EX, EX, well, I'm, 
All right, it's, so, it's, it's published everywhere anyway. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Hey, hey, Robert, before we go, I asked you sure. a few questions. Are there any anything or is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd like to, you know, bring up at this point? And I appreciate you sharing your journey. I know we went a little bit more towards your experiences in the United States and, yes. and things like that. I thought that was very important um, because, you know, for anyone who wants to travel, I think it's really important to experience other cultures in right. order to have a better perspective of reality and life. So anyway, go, take it away. Because my message for most people in the United States is that there is much more outside the border of the United States. Yeah. That is not oh, the yeah. vision. Okay. Because you've been in the army, but the, most people just don't travel. Most people yeah. travel inside the United States because it's so big and so beautiful. There is everything. That's that's I, I appreciate that. But mm -hmm. sometimes a flight to the cross the border and goes in the rest of the planet. Pay attention not to go in dangerous places. Yes, yeah. is, is is an experience that can change somebody's life. So, and then nobody can steal that money that you spend for a travel. You buy right. a car, somebody can steal the car. But if you spend yeah. the money for traveling for an experience, <laughs> nobody can steal it from you unless they. You know, <laughs> they do brain surgery. <laughs> That's one of my hashtags, making memories, right? So just get out there and make some memories, see some right. stuff, get a different perspective, right? Because yeah. talk with your... people. Yeah. Go with people. Yeah. Talk, 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 talk with people, local people. Talk. Don't just uh, okay. visit to take a picture of the, you know, touristic spot, but, you know, sit down with somebody, have a chat. Uh, there is so much to learn. Uh, even from people that don't have much to teach, you can learn that there is people that there doesn't have much to teach. So there, is, there is always a good side, don't think. Okay, sounds good. Hey, but thank you, Roberto Capodieci. Wow, fantastic. You said it correct. <laughs> All right, I was going to say it slow and wait for your approval. Uh, but thanks for sharing uh, your, your insights and experiences with us today. Um, your your expertise in blockchain, which I still don't understand, and decentralized systems <laughs> has truly enlightened our listeners, hopefully. And uh, to the audience, thank you for tuning in for another episode of Hindsight Podcast. And I hope you found the discussion on blockchain and travel in the United States uh, to be <laughs> informative and inspiring. Remember to catch us on Spotify, YouTube, and other popular streaming platforms for more engaging conversations. And until next time, Keep making wise decisions, learning from the past to shape the successful future, and get out there and travel. Thanks so much, Roberto. Thanks to you. Hey, thanks for joining me here on Hindsight, the podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know I did. And while I have you here, why don't you take your mouse and go over and click on that subscribe button? No, no, not right there. Over to the right. To, no, no, down, down, right, right there. Boom. Thank you. Now. Thank you for subscribing to Hindsight the Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones.